Chapter Four of Memoir of Jane Austen. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Memoir of Jane Austen by James Edward Austen Lee. Chapter Four: Removal from Steventon. Residences at Bath and at Southampton. Settling at Chowton. The family removed to Bath in the spring of 1801, where they resided first at Number Four, Sydney Terrace and afterwards in Green Park buildings. I do not know whether they were at all attracted to Bath by the circumstance that Mrs. Austin's only brother, Mr. Lee Perrett, spent part of every year there. The name of Perrett, together with a small estate at Northley in Oxfordshire, had been bequeathed to him by a great uncle. I must devote a few sentences to this very old and now extinct branch of the Perrett family, for one of the last survivors, Jane Perrett, married to a walker, was Jane Austen's great-grandmother, from whom she derived her Christian name. The Parrots were settled in Pembrokeshire at least as early as the thirteenth century. They were probably some of the settlers whom the policy of our Plantagenet kings placed in that county, which thence acquired the name of England beyond Wales, for the double purpose of keeping open a communication with Ireland from Milford Haven, and of overawing the Welsh. One of the family seems to have carried out this latter purpose very vigorously, for it is recorded of him that he slew twenty-six men of Kemes, a district of Wales, and one wolf. The manner in which the two kinds of game are classed together, and the disproportion of numbers, are remarkable, but probably at that time the wolves had been so closely killed down that lupicide was become a more rare and distinguished exploit than homicide. The last of this family died about 1788, and their property was divided between Lees and Musgraves, the larger portion going to the latter. Mr. Lee Parrott pulled down the mansion, and sold the estate to the Duke of Marlborough, and the name of these Parrots is now to be found only on some monuments in the church of Northley. Mr. Lee Parrott was also one of several cousins to whom a life interest in the Stone Lee property in Warwickshire was left, after the extinction of the earlier Lee peerage, but he compromised his claim to the secession in his lifetime. He married a niece of Sir Montague Cholmley of Lincolnshire. He was a man of considerable natural power, with much of the wit of his uncle, the master of Balliol, and wrote clever epigrams and riddles, some of which, though without his name, found their way into print, but he lived a very retired life, dividing his time between Bath and his place in Berkshire called Scarlet's. Jane's letters from Bath make frequent mention of this uncle and aunt. The unfinished story, now published under the title of The Watsons, must have been written during the author's residence in Bath. In the autumn of 1804 she spent some weeks at Lyme, and became acquainted with the Cobb, which she afterwards made memorable for the fall of Louisa Musgrove. In February 1805 her father died at Bath, and was buried at Walcott Church. The widow and daughters went into lodgings for a few months, and then removed to Southampton. The only records that I can find about her during these four years are the three following letters to her sister, one from Lyme, the others from Bath. They show that she went a good deal into society, in a quiet way, chiefly with ladies, and that her eyes were always open to minute traits of character in those with whom she associated. Extract from a letter from Jane Austen to her sister. Lyme, Friday, September 14, 1804. My dear Cassandra, I take the first sheet of fine striped paper to thank you for your letter from Weymouth, and express my hopes of your being at Ibthorpe before this time. I expect to hear that you reached it yesterday evening, being able to get as far as Blandford on Wednesday. Your account of Weymouth contains nothing which strikes me so forcibly as there being no ice in the town. For every other vexation I was in some measure prepared, and particularly for your disappointment in not seeing the royal family go on board on Tuesday, having already heard from Mr. Crawford that he had seen you in the very act of being too late. But for there being no ice, what could prepare me? You found my letter at Andover, I hope, yesterday, and have now for many hours been satisfied that your kind anxiety on my behalf was as much thrown away as kind anxiety usually is. I continue quite well, in proof of which I have bathed again this morning. It was absolutely necessary that I should have the little fever and indisposition which I had. It has been all the fashion this week in Lyme. We are quite settled in our lodgings by this time, as you may suppose, and everything goes on in the usual order. 
The servants behave very well, and make no difficulties, though nothing certainly can exceed the inconvenience of the offices, except the general dirtiness of the house and furniture, and all its inhabitants. I endeavor, as far as I can, to supply your place, and be useful, and keep things in order. I detect dirt in the water decanters, as fast as I can, and keep everything as it was under your administration. The ball last night was pleasant, but not full for Thursday. My father stayed contentedly till half-past nine, we went a little after eight, and then walked home with James and a lantern, though I believe the lantern was not lit, as the moon was up, but sometimes this lantern may be a great convenience to him. My mother and I stayed about an hour later. Nobody asked me the first two dances, the next two I danced with Mr. Crawford, and had I chosen to stay longer might have danced with Mr. Granville, Mrs. Granville's son, whom my dear friend Miss A. introduced me, or with a new odd-looking man who had been eyeing me for some time, and at last, without any introduction, asked me if I meant to dance again. I think he must be Irish by his ease, and because I imagine him to belong to the Honourable Bees, who are son and son's wife of an Irish Viscount, bold, queer-looking people, just fit to be quality at Lyme. I called yesterday morning, ought it not in strict propriety to be termed yester morning, on Miss A., and was introduced to her father and mother. Like other young ladies, she is considerably genteeler than her parents. Mrs. A. sat darning a pair of stockings the whole of my visit. But do not mention this at home, lest a warning should act as an example. We afterwards walked together for an hour on the cob. She is very conversable in a common way. I do not perceive wit or genius, but she has some sense and some degree of taste, and her manners are very engaging. She seems to like people rather too easily. Yours affectionately, Jane Austen. Letter from Jane Austen to her sister Cassandra at Ibthorpe alluding to the sudden death of Mrs. Lloyd at that place. 25 Gay Street, Bath, Monday, April 8, 1805 My dear Cassandra, here is a day for you. Did Bath or Ibthorpe ever see such an eighth of April? It is March and April together, the glare of the one and the warmth of the other. We do nothing but walk about. As far as your means will admit, I hope you profit by such weather, too. I dare say you are already the better for a change of pace. We were out again last night. Miss Irvine invited us, when I met her in the Crescent, to drink tea with them, but I rather declined it, having no idea that my mother would be disposed for another evening visit there so soon, but when I gave her the message I found her very well inclined to go, and accordingly, on leaving chapel, we walked to Lansdowne. This morning we have been to see Miss Chamberlain look hot on horseback. Seven years and four months ago we went to the same riding-house to see Miss Lefroy's performance. What a different set we are now moving in! But seven years, I suppose, are enough to change every pore of one's skin and every feeling of one's mind. We did not walk long in the Crescent yesterday. It was hot and not crowded enough, so we went into the field and passed close by S.T. and Miss S. again. I have not yet seen her face, but neither her dress nor air have anything of the dash or stylishness which the Browns talked of. Quite the contrary, indeed, her dress is not even smart, and her appearance very quiet. Miss Irvine says she is never speaking a word. Poor wretch! I am afraid she is en penitence. Here has been the excellent Mrs. Coulthart calling, while my mother was out, and I was believed to be so. I always respected her as a good-hearted, friendly woman." and the Browns have been here, I find their affidavits on the table. The ambuscade reached Gibraltar on the ninth of March, and found all well, so say the papers. We have had no letters from anybody, but we expect to hear from Edward to-morrow, and from you soon afterwards. How happy they are at Gottersham now! I shall be very glad of a letter from Ibthort, that I may know how you all are, but particularly yourself. This is nice weather for Mrs. J. Austin's going to Spain and I hope she will have a pleasant visit there. I expect a prodigious account of the christening dinner. Perhaps it brought you at last into the company of Miss Dundas again. Tuesday. I received your letter last night, and wish it may be soon followed by another to say that all is over, but I cannot help thinking that nature will struggle again, and produce a revival. Poor woman! May her end be peaceful and easy as the exit we have witnessed. And I dare say it will. If there is no revival, suffering must be all over. Even the consciousness of existence, I suppose, was gone when you wrote. 
The nonsense I have been writing in this and in my last letter seems out of place at such a time, but I will not mind it. It will do you no harm, and nobody else will be attacked by it. I am heartily glad that you can speak so comfortably of your own health and looks, though I can scarcely comprehend the latter being really improved. Could traveling fifty miles produce such an immediate change? You were looking very poorly here, and everybody seemed sensible of it. Is there a charm in a hack post-chaise? But, if there were, Mrs. Craven's carriage might have undone it all. I am much obliged to you for the time and trouble you have bestowed on Mary's cap, and I am glad it pleases her, but it will prove a useless gift at present, I suppose. Will she not leave Ibthorpe on her mother's death? As a companion you are all that Martha can be supposed to want, and in that light, under these circumstances, your visit will indeed have been well timed. THURSDAY I was not able to go on yesterday. All my wit and leisure were bestowed on letters to Charles and Henry. In the former I wrote in consequence of my mother's having seen in the papers that the Urania was waiting at Portsmouth for the convoy for Halifax. This is nice, as it is only three weeks ago that you wrote by the Camilla. I wrote to Henry because I had a letter from him in which he desired to hear from me very soon. His to me was most affectionate and kind, as well as entertaining. There is no merit to him in that. He cannot help being amusing. He offers to meet us on the sea-coast, if the plan of which Edward gave him some hint takes place. Will not this be making the execution of such a plan more desirable and delightful than ever? He talks of the rambles we took together last summer with pleasing affection. Yours ever, Jane Austen. From the same to the same. Gay Street, Sunday evening, April twenty first, 1805. My dear Cassandra, I am much obliged to you for writing to me again so soon. Your letter yesterday was quite an unexpected pleasure. Poor Mrs. Stent! It has been her lot to be always in the way, but we must be merciful, for perhaps in time we may come to be Mrs. Stent's ourselves, unequal to anything and unwelcome to everybody. My morning engagement was with the cooks, and our party consisted of George and Mary, a Mr. L., Miss B., who had been with us at the concert, and the youngest Miss W., not Julia, we have done with her, she is very ill, but Mary. Mary W.'s turn is actually come to be grown up, and have a fine complexion, and wear great square muslin shawls. I have not expressly enumerated myself among the party, but there I was, and my cousin George was very kind, and talked sense to me every now and then, in the intervals of his more animated fooleries with Miss B., who is very young, and rather handsome, and whose gracious manners, ready wit, and solid remarks put me somewhat in mind of my old acquaintance, L. L. There was a monstrous deal of stupid quizzing and commonplace nonsense talked, but scarcely any wit. All that bordered on it, or on sense, came from my cousin George, whom altogether I like very well. Mr. B. seems nothing more than a tall young man. My evening engagement and walk was with Miss A., who had called on me the day before, and gently upbraided me in her turn with a change of manners to her since she had been in Bath, or at least of late. Unlucky me, that my notice should be of such consequence, and my manners so bad. She was so well disposed and so reasonable that I soon forgave her, and made this engagement with her in proof of it. She is really an agreeable girl, so I think I may like her, and her great want of a companion at home, which may well make any tolerable acquaintance important to her, gives her another claim on my attention. I shall endeavor as much as possible to keep my intimacies in their proper place, and prevent their clashing. Among so many friends it will be well if I do not get into a scrape, and now here is Miss Blashford come. I should have gone distracted if the Bullers had stayed. When I tell you I have been visiting a countess this morning, you will immediately, with great justice, but no truth, guess it to be Lady Roden. No, it is Lady Levin, the mother of Lord Balgoni. On receiving a message from Lord and Lady Levin through the Mackays, declaring their intention of waiting on us, we thought it right to go to them. I hope we have not done too much, but the friends and admirers of Charles must be attended to. They seem very reasonable, good sort of people, very civil and full of his praise. We were shown at first into an empty drawing-room, and presently in came his lordship, not knowing who we were, to apologize for the servant's mistake, and to say himself what was untrue, that Lady Levin was not within. He is a tall, gentleman-like-looking man, with spectacles, and rather deaf. 
After sitting with him ten minutes we walked away, but Lady Levin, coming out of the dining parlour as we passed the door, we were obliged to attend her back to it, and pay our visit over again. She is a stout woman with a very handsome face. By this means we had the pleasure of hearing Charles's praises twice over. They think themselves excessively obliged to him, and estimate him so highly as to wish Lord Balgani, when he is quite recovered, to go out to him. There is a pretty little Lady Marion of the party, to be shaken hands with, and asked if she remembered Mr. Austin. I shall write to Charles by the next packet, unless you tell me in the meantime of your intending to do it. Believe me if you choose, your affectionate sister. Jane did not estimate too highly the cousin George mentioned in the foregoing letter, who might easily have been superior in sense and wit to the rest of the party. He was the Reverend George Lee Cook, long known and respected at Oxford, where he held important offices, and had the privilege of helping to form the minds of men more eminent than himself. As tutor in Corpus Christi College, he became instructor to some of the most distinguished undergraduates of that time, amongst others to Dr. Arnold, the Reverend John Kebble, and Sir John Coleridge. The latter has mentioned him in terms of affectionate regard, both in his memoir of Kebble and in a letter which appears in Dean Stanley's Life of Arnold. Mr. Cook was also an impressive preacher of earnest awakening sermons. I remember to have heard it observed by some of my undergraduate friends that, after all, there was more good to be got from George Cook's plain sermons than from much of the more labored oratory of the university pulpit. He was frequently examiner in the schools, and occupied the chair of the Sedleian Professor of Natural Philosophy from 1810 to 1853. Before the end of 1805, the little family party removed to Southampton. They resided in a commodious, old-fashioned house in a corner of Castle Square. I have no letters of my aunt, nor any other record of her, during her four years' residence at Southampton, and though I now began to know, and what was the same thing, to love her myself, yet my observations were only those of a young boy, and were not capable of penetrating her character or estimating her powers. I have, however, a lively recollection of some local circumstances at Southampton, and as they refer chiefly to things which have been long ago swept away, I will record them. My grandmother's house had a pleasant garden, bounded on one side by the old city walls, the top of this wall was sufficiently wide to afford a pleasant walk, with an extensive view, easily accessible to ladies by steps. This must have been a part of the identical walls which witnessed the embarkation of Henry V before the Battle of Agincourt, and the detection of the conspiracy of Cambridge, Scroop, and Gray, which Shakespeare has made so picturesque, when, according to the chorus in Henry V, the citizens saw the well-appointed king at Hampton Pier embark his royalty. Among the records of the town of Southampton, they have a minute and authentic account, drawn up at that time, of the encampment of Henry V near the town, before his embarkment for France. It is remarkable that the place where the army was encamped, then a low, level plain, is now entirely covered by the sea, and is called Westport. At that time, Castle Square was occupied by a fantastic edifice, too large for the space in which it stood, though too small to accord well with its castellated style, erected by the second Marquis of Lansdowne, half-brother to the well-known statesman who succeeded him in the title. The Marchioness had a light phaeton, drawn by six, and sometimes by eight little ponies, each pair decreasing in size and becoming lighter in color, through all the shades of dark brown, light brown, bay and chestnut, as it was placed farther away from the carriage. The two leading pairs were managed by two boyish postillions. The two pairs nearest to the carriage were driven in hand. It was a delight to me to look down from the window and see this fairy equipage put together, for the premises of this castle were so contracted that the whole process went on in the little space that remained of the open square. Like other fairy works, however, it all proved evanescent. Not only carriage and ponies, but castle itself soon vanished away, like the baseless fabric of a vision. On the death of the Marquis in 1809, the castle was pulled down, Few probably remember its existence, and any one who might visit the place now would wonder how it ever could have stood there. In 1809 Mr. Knight was able to offer his mother the choice of two houses on his property, one near his usual residence at Godmersham Park in Kent, the other near Chawton House, his occasional residence in Hampshire. 
The latter was chosen, and in that year the mother and daughters, together with Miss Lloyd, a near connection who lived with them, settled themselves at Chawton College. Chawton may be called the second, as well as the last, home of Jane Austen, for during the temporary residences of the party at Bath and Southampton she was only a sojourner in a strange land, but here she found a real home amongst her own people. It so happened that during her residence at Chawton circumstances brought several of her brothers and their families within easy distance of the house. Chawton must also be considered the place most closely connected with her career as a writer, for there it was that, in the maturity of her mind, she either wrote or rearranged, and prepared for publication, the books by which she has become known to the world. This was the home where, after a few years, while still in the prime of life, she began to droop and wither away, and which she left only in the last stage of her illness, yielding to the persuasion of friends, hoping against hope. This house stood in the village of Chawton, about a mile from Alton, on the right-hand side, just where the road to Winchester branches off from that to Gosport. It was so close to the road that the front door opened upon it, while a very narrow enclosure, paled in on each side, protected the building from danger of collision with any runaway vehicle. I believe it had been originally built for an inn, for which purpose it was certainly well situated. Afterwards it had been occupied by Mr. Knight's steward, but by some additions to the house, and some judicious planting and screening, it was made a pleasant and commodious abode. Mr. Knight was experienced and adroit at such arrangements, and this was a labor of love to him. A good-sized entrance and two sitting-rooms made the length of the house, all intended originally to look upon the road, but the large drawing-room window was blocked up and turned into a bookcase, and another opened at the side which gave to view only turf and trees, as a high wooden fence and horn-beam edge shut out the Winchester Road, which skirted the whole length of the little domain. Trees were planted to each side to form a shrubbery walk, carried round the enclosure, which gave a sufficient space for ladies' exercise. There was a pleasant, irregular mixture of hedgerow and gravel walk and orchard, and long grass for mowing, arising from two or three little enclosures having been thrown together. The house itself was quite as good as the generality of parsonage houses then were, and much in the same style, and was capable of receiving other members of the family as frequent visitors. It was sufficiently well furnished, everything inside and out was kept in good repair, and it was altogether a comfortable and ladylike establishment, though the means which supported it were not large. I give this description because some interest is generally taken in the residence of a popular writer. Cowper's unattractive house in the street of Olney has been pointed out to visitors, and has even attained the honor of an engraving in Southey's edition of his works, but I cannot recommend any admirer of Jane Austen to undertake a pilgrimage to this spot. The building, indeed, still stands, but it has lost all that gave it its character. After the death of Mrs. Cassandra Austen in 1845, it was divided into tenements for laborers, and the grounds reverted to ordinary uses. End of chapter 4